Hello there, everyone. It has come to my attention that Bill talked about nuclear energy in the first episode of his new series, Bill Nye Saves the World, and I thought I'd respond to some of the things he and his panel have said. It seems, unfortunately, that my prediction in my last video about Bill has come true, that rather than produce another TV show like Bill Nye the Science Guy, in which he was an impartial educator, he has chosen once again, as he did in The Eyes of Nye, to abuse his image as the spokesperson for science to present his subjective political opinions as if they are objective scientific fact. As such, I will be making an attempt to deconstruct his bias in this video. Let's begin. No matter where we live, the first step to fighting climate change is limiting our use of fossil fuels. So please join me with my distinguished panel. It's great to see you all. Dr. Mark Jacobson, civil engineer. Richard Martin, journalist and author of The Coal Wars and the Future of Energy and the Fate of the Planet. You've also uh, written about thorium. And Taryn O'Neill, you're a writer and co-founder of a science advocacy group called Sirens. Yes. Right? Would I say Skyrens? Some people do, but it's Sirens. It's Sirens, like science. Yeah, screen Sirens for Sirens. Yes, people. So, Dr. Jacobson, we have met. Yes. Mark. Yes. I call him Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you have a vision, a cool vision, right? Yes. Tell us about that. So the idea is to transform the energy infrastructures of states and countries to 100% clean renewable energy for all purposes. That's impossible. <laughs> Some would say. Many people would say it's impossible, but actually it's technologically and economically possible. The main barriers are social and political. You're saying we have the technology right now to run the whole place renewably? Yes, we have the technology and the costs are reasonable enough that you can power the entire world for all purposes with clean, renewable energy and have stable electricity, create jobs, and stabilize energy prices. Richard, before you th throttle him... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, I'll be honest. My issue with this quote is probably going to be my weakest argument in this entire video, mostly because it's entirely subjective, but... The way Bill said that really ticks me off. Richard, before you th throttle him. Are your political opponents inherently violent, Bill? Did you bring him here to not only be opposition, but angry opposition, in order to make you look better? I realize he was just joking, but to me this comment in particular made it seem like Bill holds Mr. Martin in much less esteem than everyone else at the table. Do you agree with him? I agree that it's a beautiful vision, but it's a utopian vision and we have to live in the real world. And in the real world, getting to 100% wind and solar and other forms of renewable Geothermal, energy is going to be very, title. very difficult. This is sprinkled in. For those and we know. don't have the time to work through the social and political barriers that Mark talks about. What, what's your alternative? The if alternative there is, is nuclear power. We already have a safe, clean, source of zero carbon energy and it already provides one-fifth of the electricity in this country but we're closing down nuclear plants. It was at this point in the clip that I actually felt relieved. When Bill introduced Mr. Martin as an advocate for thorium nuclear power plants, I had figured, well, that's it then. Martin's already won the argument. I do not currently know of any existing argument capable of justifying why thorium plants should not be constructed. Their waste only lasts for 300 years. They're practically incapable of experiencing a reactor core meltdown due to a number of factors. Thorium is incredibly difficult to turn into a nuclear weapon and useless in the form of a dirty bomb. Thorium reactors also happen to produce much more energy than traditional uranium and plutonium reactors. Simply put, I could not conceive of any argument Bill could possibly have against thorium reactors, and after Mr. Martin said what he did, I had no idea how Bill was going to respond. So here's the problem for me, civilian, normal guy. Why do we... normal-ish. Why do we want to go making more nuclear power plants when B, nobody wants them, and A, we probably don't need them. Is that a true fact or a false fact? That's a joke. False fact's a joke. <laughs> okay, let me address those points in the A-B order you gave them then, Bill, considering you didn't allow Mr. Martin to address them, as Dr. Jacobson is the next person to begin talking. We probably don't need them. 
Oh, you mean in the same way that we don't actually need energy? We could just survive on sticks and stones and gathering nuts and berries? I suppose in that sense, you're correct. But if we actually want energy, we absolutely do need nuclear power plants. Nuclear produces significantly more energy than any other energy source. I can demonstrate that to be true. Nuclear energy is currently the most effective form of energy generation to date. You want to end the world energy crisis? Nuclear energy is your best bet. Secondly, nobody wants them. Gee, Bill, I'm glad you're no longer arguing that they're unsafe, but I just couldn't imagine why nobody wants them. You know, it's almost as if people fear-mongered to the public for years about nuclear power plants, spreading absolute lies and disinformation in an attempt to terrify them into rejecting nuclear power altogether. If only you knew someone, Bill, who had produced a fear-mongering nuclear energy video filled with absolute lies. Someone who had produced such a video with the express purpose of terrifying the public into rejecting nuclear energy. Know anyone who did that? Bill? No, it's, it's, it's true, we don't need them. And B, it might be, is that it's impossible to solve the global warming problem with nuclear. And I'll just give you an example why. Well, that's just a flat out lie. I'll address any justification he attempts to make, though. The, to avoid one and a half degrees Celsius warming, which is what most people are seeking, or even two degrees Celsius warming. But of the whole world. Of the whole world, on average. But in order to do that, we need to eliminate 80% of all fossil fuel and biofuel emissions. Of but the goal really is 100%. Yeah? yeah, but by 2030, we need to eliminate 80%. 2030? That's next week. <laughs> yeah, in 14 years. And 100% by 2050. If you can eliminate 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050, then you can avoid or, or barely, maybe barely avoid 1.5 degree warming. However, just to get one nuclear power plant sited, site permit, construction permit, construction permit and issue, and constructed, it takes 10 to 19 years for one. We would need 15,000 of these worldwide to power the whole world with nuclear. First, Jacobson has deceptively worded this statement in such a way as to imply that they have to be built one by one. In reality, many could be constructed at once. 2030 is 13 years away, and for a start, that actually falls within his little 10 to 19 year time frame he has there. But I've got more to take issue with. I would love to see a citation of his 15,000 number of worldwide plants to achieve 100% nuclear, because nuclear power generation can vary wildly across different generations and types of nuclear power plants. Considering he has an agenda on this show to be contrarian toward the points brought up by the nuclear expert, I would imagine Jacobson is taking the absolute least charitable numbers possible. Though I reiterate, that is only an assumption, considering I have no idea where he is getting his information. But on to his other point, the 10 to 19 year time frame. Notice what he says is taking so long. Site permit, construction permit, construction permit and issue, permit, permit, permit. Did you notice how he didn't actually give a time frame for these permits? How he just said that they were a part of the 10 to 19 year time frame? Gee, I wonder why he would do that. No, actually, I know exactly why he would do that. Let me show you. So the first thing we're going to take issue with is his ridiculous 10 to 19 year time frame. Because not only is he way off, he is off to the tune of an entire decade. That's right, according to the Nuclear Energy Institute, including the time it takes for a licensing, a nuclear power plant takes nine years to build. Not satisfied? The International Atomic Energy Agency of the UN anticipated taking between 10 and 15 years for a member state country without any power plants whatsoever yet to begin a nuclear energy program. It takes less time to start an entire nuclear energy program in a brand new country than he said it would take to build one plant in a country that already has them. Want more? The Nuclear Energy Agency tells a similar story to the Nuclear Energy Institute, stating that it takes between five to seven Seven years to build a large nuclear power plant, but when construction is optimized, such as it is in South Korea, it can take between four and six. Would you like me to keep going? Because I can. 
So allow me to make this abundantly clear. These anti-nuclear and anti-science fear mongers have shackled incredibly restrictive regulations onto nuclear power in order to slow down and in some cases altogether stop the construction of nuclear power plants. So-called green lobbies have been doing this for years. As they claim to fight for cleaner power sources like wind and solar, they are systematically destroying the most effective clean energy source on the planet, all out of a sense of ignorant fear. It doesn't take nine years to build a nuclear power facility. It can take as little as four. But because of the actions of these uneducated nutcases, it takes an extra five years just to get through all the bureaucracy. And the other problem, just hang on, the other problem for me, civilian man, no, hang on. What's wrong, Bill? Afraid of letting the expert on nuclear energy speak? I couldn't imagine why. Is nobody wants them. No, nobody really wants nuclear power plants. I mean, I've been to Johannesburg and Olympia, Washington in the United States, and there are cooling towers in the middle of town. And nobody, they just got shut down before they got built because people just don't want it. And whose fault is that exactly, Bill? Who made sure that was the case? So Mark, here's my question for you. The big thing, everybody, this is not too technical, is the base load. Sun's out. I have solar panels in Studio City, California, which is like, if you don't know, watching around the world, it's like totally in the valley. <laughs> and I have like solar panels, and my electric bill is $10 every 60 days. <laughs> it's cool. But the sun doesn't shine at night. November, December, early January, I don't make as much electricity as I use. So what about storage? What about providing electricity when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing? You know, it's funny that he mentions the sun not shining at night because now we get to talk about energy capacity factors. See, he's alluding to what is actually a very important point here. The sun is not always shining, the wind is not always blowing, and energy generation facilities can be measured by how often they are actually producing energy over a 24-hour time period. Let's take a look at the relative energy capacity factors, shall we? This is a chart from the United States Energy Information Administration demonstrating the relative capacity factors for specific types of energy generation. You can see wind down there near the bottom sitting at 30% on average. Solar isn't on this chart, but has a 33.9% capacity factor on average. Coal has about 63.8% on average. Pretty high. But oh, what's this? Nuclear energy at the very, very top, with an average of 90.3%? It's almost as if nuclear is self-evidently superior to every other form of energy generation. Right. So, so First of all, you can store uh, solar electricity. There's what's called concentrated solar power, where you have focused light onto a mirror. Well, many plants do, concentrated solar plants do have storage. You store heat. You store the heat, and then whenever you need the electricity, you run the heat by water to heat the water. A conventional steam turbine, and so does a fission nuclear power plant, gets, uses heat to run a turbine. So, in the end, being utterly incapable of surpassing the method by which nuclear energy generates electricity, the heat generated from solar power is used to create a sort of miniature nuclear power facility in order to store energy. Well, on top of being much less effective, considering all the energy lost as a result of transferring to all these different energy retention mediums, I think I've found another problem. Bill, if this is true, and you will be using stored solar heat to turn a steam turbine in order to generate electricity, won't you have to build <gasps> coolant towers to let the steam out? Didn't you just say the public was afraid of those? Maybe you shouldn't have spent all that time making sure the public associated cooling towers with a nuclear holocaust, huh? Correct. But also, existing hydroelectric power is like a big battery. You can turn it on and off like a spigot to create electricity. A big spigot. Big spigot to create electricity when you need it. You have what's called pumped hydroelectric storage, where you, when you have extra electricity, like too much wind, for example, at night, uh, you can then pump water up a hill. And then when you need the electricity, you let the water drain down the hill to run a turbine. But let me just say, I, I've spent some time with Do Dr. Jacobson. And the key to this, if I understand it, doctor, is you've done an analysis. You're not just bill throwing out ideas you've done careful analysis a utility district 
right? Nice pivot, Bill. We have to get off the topic of nuclear energy. We can't let Martin respond. Because if your audience actually learned what nuclear energy is, they would abandon all your little solar and wind projects that you care so much about. If you truly cared about humanity, about scientific advancement, and about the quality of people's lives, you would be backing nuclear energy. But you never cared about people. Or at least... You don't now. You care about your ideological goals. You care about politics. You care about looking good in front of the cameras and being seen as a good person. You are willing to go another day robbing the people of this world of energy because your politics are more important than their suffering. I'm going to skip a bit ahead because much of this is utopian ideological fellatio, and I'm not interested in watching a bunch of upper-class elitists pat each other on the back about how virtuous they are for looking out for the environment. Terror. You know, we as non-scientists, we're like, we want to make a change, we want to take action. What are the first simple steps that we can do to get to this future? Like, who are we, ta are we talking to our congressmen? Are we just making changes at home? What can we as, as non-scientists, as non-brilliant engineers do? Because we do want this future, but we don't know how to go there and we don't want to get rid of our car right away. Like, yeah. trying to be a realist. Here. Vote. Yes. yes. <laughs> if, you, if you don't want to vote, if you don't want to vote, would you just shut up? <laughs> and let the rest of us who are interested to, you know, participate. In our future. The first step, to answer Taryn's question as well, the first step is to become aware. So for, for so long, we flipped the switch. The lights come on, we don't think about where it comes from. The, what's happened with food, the local food movement, people becoming aware of where their food comes from, the same thing is happening with electricity. Oh, I'm getting all this electricity from a coal plant. Why do I have to do that? People are starting to demand a choice and how they get their energy. And I think that's gonna be a huge change that will enable a lot of them. Except this is wrong. And this is where I became very disappointed with Mr. Martin. You see, it isn't people that are demanding a choice in where their energy comes from. It's a certain type of people. The rich are demanding a choice because they can afford to. In fact, they can just move. The middle class are demanding a choice because they have that luxury. They can afford to pay a slightly higher electric bill so long as they feel as though their morality is being sated so that they can feel they're good people and feel as though others look at them as if they are good people in turn. But the poor, the people that truly suffer from this kind of elitist moralizing, they don't have a choice. They have to have electricity and the higher the bill, the more they suffer. These people working three minimum wage jobs and barely keeping their head above water, living check to check and surviving by the skin of their teeth. They cannot afford to pay for your morality. Bill, you say that you're doing all this for the earth. That's what you and the people you seem to champion keep saying. But this panel just further demonstrates that's a lie. You never cared about the earth. You just like feeling as though you do. If you truly cared about climate change and the Earth, nuclear energy is not only the most efficient form of energy generation, it's clean. You would begin public campaigns raising awareness about how safe and effective nuclear energy is, about how the public had no reason to fear it anymore. Hell, you have a show, don't you? Wouldn't you be using your televised pulpit right now to tell people about how nuclear energy does not pollute at all and could solve the world's energy crisis as well as climate change? But no. Here you are, desperately trying to reconcile your attempts to save the world and why you cannot accept the perfect solution staring you right in the face. Well, if you can't seem to understand, perhaps I can clue you in. You and the people you represent never cared about the Earth, and you never cared about science. You care about feeling like good people. You care about the way other people see you, and you want to be seen as a good and virtuous person. And in your circles, people that care about the environment are virtuous. Scientists, at least ones that agree with you, are virtuous. And the political left is virtuous. And because you want to be seen as virtuous, you cannot accept nuclear energy. Because for some reason, it is a current enemy of the left. Even though it would perfectly solve the problem you purport to be trying to solve, it would usurp your real goal. Peacocking for wealthy elites with enough money to pay for their faux morality. 
A luxury the poor you are directly subjugating with these policies cannot afford. But who cares about them, right? As their poverty increases due to your moral energy policies, and they begin voting for the right in an attempt to save themselves from the abject serfdom you will have subjected them to, you'll just call them crazy and stupid, won't you? After all, if they were truly upset, why not just let them eat cake? The world is going to be in serious trouble if we don't do something about it. And by that I mean everybody who lives on coastlines, everybody who likes to eat or breathe. Uh, many of my friends are that way. And so the alternative is, it reminds me very much of the Second World War because my parents were in it and you know, you hear it as hard as I could, I'd listen to stories. There was a problem. I mean, <laughs> they had a worldwide problem and they solved it because they had to. Are we going to get to a point? Yes. Amusingly, I think you're underestimating how far people will allow their ideological conformity to corrupt their sense of reason. It's why you're still anti-nuclear, after all. Are we going to get to a point where we're going to solve it? Well, World War II is an example. I mean, that was so imminent. That was in your face. That was destruction. Um, we're seeing that on a much longer time scale, and we think of things in terms of fiscal quarters and, you know, an annual year. We don't think on Earnings the large reports. scale. Sorry? Earnings reports. Exactly. Sorry. We don't think on the large scale that science teaches us to, of how it teaches us to. Ugh. Look, I know this is a weird criticism, but that line, we don't think on the large scale that science teaches us to, of how it teaches us to. It just makes my skin crawl. It sounds so... Well, religious. Not that there's anything wrong with religion per se, but it just sounds so spiritual. It's as if she's saying that there's some overarching deity that teaches the scientific way as if it were an ideology to follow. It's just creepy. I agree that science is important, and that the way in which we are taught the scientific method by fellow humans places an emphasis on viewing the big picture, but I don't think I would have worded it like a pastor delivering a sermon. And secondly, it's funny that she mentions viewing the big picture, because that is something that is absolutely not done for nuclear energy. Because deaths due to nuclear energy tend to all happen at once, i.e. Chernobyl, they make for the perfect media firestorms. They generate ratings, because the public is really interested in anything involving the word nuclear, and they plant a false image in the minds of people that nuclear facilities are dangerous. Think about it this way. There were 35,092 fatalities due to car wrecks in the year of 2015. This figure is given very little attention, and everyone kind of expects it anyway. But now imagine that every single one of those deaths occurred on exactly the same day. The number of people that died that year wouldn't have changed, but it would get much more attention, both from the public and the media, because it all happened at once. If you are willing to look at the big picture, Miss Taryn, I suggest you take a look at nuclear energy. So I feel like we need to change this narrative of this, you know, we have the dystopian sci-fi where we know the bad things that can happen, but what if we create a more positive image of this future of what- We ought what to do a show about it. We should do a show about it. Let's put on a show. <laughs> hey, thanks you guys. This has been great, a hand for the panel. We can do this. Come on, we can do this. Thank you all. And thank you, Bill, by making it abundantly clear where your bias is held, so that I have an easy time pulling it apart. I wish I could say it was fun, but I think I'd actually much prefer if you conducted yourself in a way that earned your title of science guy. As for you, my audience, thank you for tuning in. I realize some of you are here as a direct result of the claims he made on his new show, and I'd like to welcome you to the club. For many of you, this new show of his was a wake-up call, and he surprised you in a way that made you feel as if you had been betrayed, because you remember him being unbiased and very scientific. Unfortunately, this is not the case. He was merely an educator in the show many of you remember him from, that being Bill Nye the Science Guy, but he's participated in this sort of political bias before. His Eyes of Nye series that ran in the early 2000s seems like a precursor to this one, which is disappointing, as I had hoped he was capable of recognizing that he was being politically biased. Unfortunately, his bias only seems to have gotten worse. But that will be all for today. I may do another video addressing some of the other topics he's attempted to weigh in on on this new show, but I thought I'd do one addressing his nuclear comments first, as those are my forte. 
If you haven't already, I invite you to check out my first video debunking Bill. Although it's quite long, I assure you it's very substantial and well-researched. If you ever wanted to see someone pull one of his episodes apart molecule by molecule, I'm your man. Until next time. Remember to be highly skeptical of people who claim to be completely objective sources. We're all capable of bias, and no one is without an agenda. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.